from wherever you are. Welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. Last time, we went into one of the forerunners of some modern card games, Whist. This time, I'm going to show you how it developed into our current version of Bridge and some other card games that are out there and different ways to play Whist now that we've learned the basic concepts. Let's get stuck in. So last time we discussed how to play Whist as a general concept with four players. But just because you don't have four players doesn't mean you still can't play. There's a way to do simply two-player Whist. Let me show you how. So take your card deck like you did before, and always make sure you shuffle. I'm going to emphasize that every single time from here until whenever the series ends. What you do is you deal 13 cards per side. So and you're gonna take the remaining cards and put it in the center. So now that you've placed these cards in the center, ignore them for just a moment. Take your cards and put them in order like you did last time when we were learning how to play Whist. And go ahead and get them in the suit order. And almost all of the general rules are going to apply. The big difference this time is Obviously, not all of the cards are going to be on the board. And not all of the cards are available. Uh, and if you're playing with a full deck, please make sure you take out the jokers. You will not need it for this version. I have made that mistake more than enough times for my own good. So now that you've got everything slightly out of order situated, You'll go ahead and uh, place it here. Uh, there's no bidding involved with this one, but the element that you're trying to do here is the first cards. You're going to be determining how to improve your deck the best. So this first part of the game doesn't count towards the trick total. All we're trying to do is improve the hand. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this top card and you're gonna flip it over. So, what you're wanting to do with two player whist is, do you want that card? If you want that card, you try and win the hand. If you don't want that card, say if this had been a two of hearts, you throw it away. But realize whatever you play, you still have to follow suit. You still have to work within reason here. And I kind of want that Jack of Hearts. The problem is player one only has the Queen of Hearts to play. So no matter how, they're trading off. So they're going to play the Queen like they have to. So from player two's perspective, they have the King and the Ace of hearts. So what they're going to do is they are going to play the low card. They're getting rid of a card that's only going to cause them to lose later. And this means we take it out. And since they won, they're going to put it here. And then the losing player will take a card unseen. So they don't know what they're getting. Uh, so a mild improvement, a nine of hearts. So there's some element of chance where you could get a card that you want, lose and get a better card, or you might not get a card you want and get an even better card with the blind draw. So you're gonna flip it again and the same rule is gonna apply. You're gonna wanna play a spade. That's a good card to have. So what are you gonna do if you want that? Try and guarantee yourself a position. Uh, we'll do this king right here. Basically, we're going to 
trade off with the potential that they know they're not going to have the ace or the king to play, but they'll have a jack for later. But that means that it's going to throw away the four here. Why? Sometimes you may want to intentionally lose if we've got an upcoming bad card. So we're going to dispose of this. Player one is going to get that ace and we'll just nestle it in right there. And then the blind card is seven. So not great, not terrible, kind of a middle of the road hand. We're going to flip it again and we're going to go ahead and do this process over until we get to the end of here. Then the real game begins. So now that we have gotten through all of these, these are discarded. We don't have to worry about these for the rest of the game. And it should be pretty good information as to what's been played so far, what's left on the board. So you get kind of an idea of what each person has in a general sense. Now we resume our normal whist playing rules where the person who lays out the first card is going to select a trump and the person has to attempt to follow. Now, you saw here, if you were watching along as we sped it up a little, that a lot of the court cards of one or two suits ended up with particular people. So it heightens the likelihood that somebody's going to win a hand. So you're trading off how well can you win a hand versus someone else. So after we go through all this, we're going to have player one go first. Uh, so they are going to go ahead and put down the Ace of Spades, knowing that earlier in the game, the King was played. So they know that they don't have a high card, so they're going to follow suit here like they have to. But since they know they're going to lose, they'll play the low card. So yes, player one wins it, but you have used one of your better cards and you're trying to consume it. So we'll do the same here. Get rid of another low card. And then now you're starting to try and recall what's available. You don't know if they have a spade, if a, they have a club or not. They can't follow suit. So they're going to use this opportunity to get rid of another one of their bad cards. But this also tells them, hey, they don't have a club to play. So sometimes they'll waste a higher ranking card to try and make it seem like there's, it's not as bad as it is. So back here, we're gonna go ahead and see if that club advantage really is there. And we're gonna find out fairly quickly that yes, it is. So then we're gonna play this heart. They can't follow suit. So they're gonna get rid of this seven here. So at least there's a little bit of options here. Um, what's left? We're going to play this. They have to follow suit. So player one's going to win that one. Followed by my queen. We're going to win that one as well. Now we're starting to run out of options. Uh, they can't follow suit. So they are going to play this because they have enough diamond, they have enough uh, clubs left that they don't want to get rid of the high card here. So what they're going to do is now play, since they know they can't follow suit, they're going to have to get rid of a card that they don't particularly want to, but they will anyways. And then it'll be time for being unable to follow suit here. So getting rid of yet another card. Now we're into being able to use all of the advantage that they have left. Now it's going to be here and here. And then these last two player ones, the one that decides Trump suit. So there we have it. So it ended up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to five. 
So we keep those scoring rules similar to how it was for four player whist, but we at least go through and have the ability to try and improve your hand. It's also played to five or 15, depending on how you want to play it. But that is two player whist. What if you have more than two people or more than four people who are wanting to play? There's a way to do that too. Hold on. Last time, I talked about the development of the game in Europe, specifically in England, and it did spread fairly consistently all around the continent. But there's one place we haven't talked about yet, the United States. Whist took off among the gentlemanly social classes, and we specifically have a quote from our first Postmaster General. Ebenezer Hazard was staying in Williamsburg, Virginia around the 1740s, and he denoted that more often than not, colonists were much addicted to gambling, drinking, swearing, horse racing, fighting, and most kinds of dissipation. But the game that he thought was the most dangerous was whist. Even our first president was not immune to this addiction. We actually note in 1748, he put in his log that he lost two shillings and three pence to his sister-in-law playing whist. We've now got two player and four player whist already as a concept. So let's make a party game out of it for seven players. There's an easy way to do this. It's called knockout whist. What you're gonna do is the same principle applies. You're choosing a trump suit, highest trump. So we're gonna go ahead and make enough for seven and we're gonna deal as many cards as there are players. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And yes, you will have cards left over, but that is gonna help us with the start of the game. Now, what we're gonna have happen is you can hold it much like you would hold a hand of cards if you were playing any other card game. Uh, and what you're gonna have is at this point, the spades is going to be your trump suit for this hand. Well, someone can't play in spade trumps, so they're gonna have to figure out what to do. Uh, they are gonna play this. So we'll go ahead and go around. They have one to play, jack, so they've gotta go ahead and play it. Uh, this person has the queen. see, uh, this person has the ace of spades. Now, what you're wanting to do here is win at least once. That's all that matters here is that you win once. Anyone who doesn't win at least one is out. This person sadly has to use their king of spades. So this is collected and given to what we'll call one, two, three, player four over here. And now what you're going to do is this person who has their remaining hand knows there are six cards left. They get to pick the suit. So they're going to say, you know what? We're going to do clubs and place it down. After we got through this round, we had five players who won at least one trick, which means these two players right here are in some danger. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to reshuffle the deck and we're gonna deal again, but these two are gonna have some special considerations, but they're not eliminated just yet. Like I said, we're gonna deal again and here, and here are gonna have some special considerations. So now we have everybody has been dealt one card. These two are what are called dead dogs. And 
they get one card. They can play the one card at any time, but they have to win with it, otherwise they're out. It's not a guarantee, but it's a chance. Everyone else is dealt with like normal, so. We're gonna do the same thing that we did last time. Notice there are more cards here, which means there's fewer left. So we've got ourselves spades as suit. Uh, they can't follow, so they're just gonna go ahead and get rid of that. So they've got three, we're gonna keep them face up. So it would be on suit, but they have to wait and see what is gonna be played here. And they're playing the king knowing full well that they may have an ace here, which unfortunately this player does. But the odds were increased that it wasn't going to be there. So sometimes it's just generally bad luck. But let's say for the sake of conversation that these two didn't use it. So this player will win the round. And what's gonna happen from here is they'll go all the way around like they did before. If neither of them win, they're out. If they win one round, they're back in. They're back in regular, but if they lose in that segment, they're completely eliminated. You get one chance at winning. So that is, in a simplistic way, knockout whist. Now I've talked about the development so far of Whist as a gentleman's game. Well, as card decks become easier to produce and cheaper, it came available to all social classes. But you did see the gentlemanly and nobility class change to Baccarat and other major gambling style games, which you actually saw a major royal Baccarat scandal in the 19th century. But there was a resurgence in the late 19th, early 20th century of whist, cementing its place as England's national card game. Now that we've covered the basics of what a trick-taking game is, you can make your own anytime you like. If you have an idea for how a trick-taking game could work, you're more than welcome to, as long as you abide by some general rules, any trick-taking game can work. So, a couple things to decide. Are there teams? Is everyone on their own? Remember, in four-player whist, we had partnerships. Maybe for some reason you want it to be where the cards are all played at the same time. Or you could have it where player one and player three are playing against each other, and two and four are playing against each other in their own version of Knockout. Do you want it to be similar to two-player whist, but with four players where you're doing the bidding for a card? Do you want to do knockout in some new and different way? You can make it in any way you choose, as long as you generally go by a high card, low card, bidding, however you like. So experiment. Try your own different way. You may find that there's a house game that you end up loving and you can teach your friends and family. If this game has developed over the centuries as a popular game, why is it not as commonly played? Well, over time the rules got supplanted and it became a social game in the Americas and later over back into Europe and it became known as bridge. There are some slight rule changes and the way that scoring works is slightly different, but Whist is the base game, which is why I wanted to tell you about it so much. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed learning this game and you may see some games like it in future based off of this concept. So be sure to check back if you need a refresher. Also, be sure to check out the other great NPL Universe programming that we have on the library website and on our YouTube page. Also, let us know in the comments what game you might want to see next. You may see it before you think. I'll see you next time.